Have you been looking for a way to stay focused on your goals and grow your MSP? Accountability groups from Rocket MSP can help. We offer weekly accountability sessions that meet online with a group of your peers. Your success begins with accountability. Go to www.rocketmsp.io to join your accountability group today. We're live. Uh, welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Rocket MSP Podcast. I'm Steve Taylor, your host. Today, I'm joined by Eric, uh, Eric Hester, actually, from Umbrella Technology Group. Now, this sounds like, I don't know, some kind of evil corporation. Yeah, that's Maybe. usually the, the connection people make right away is to the uh, Resident Evil Umbrella Corporation, but... Uh... I was going was for the more uh, all-encompassing uh, technology provider, um, but uh, yeah, it's hard not to make that connection. Yeah, so I, you know, I, I I'm going to sound like a loser. I didn't really get into the Resident Evil games. Uh, I, I didn't much either. I watched the movies a couple times too, but uh, yeah, it, it absolutely. I mean, I know, I know what uh, Umbrella Corp was, and uh, definitely. Did not come to mind as I was building it, but it has very much since I have done it. Oh, good. Now, there's uh, there's an insurance company, and I swear their logo is an umbrella. Uh, Travelers Insurance, yeah, has an umbrella. Ours is yeah. a little bit different. It's just kind of built into the logo. Yeah, the yeah. No, the, um, it's just, it's, you know, it's it's nice to go from, like, one extreme to the other, you know, like... Right. And that's, I feel like you're probably more toward the traveler's side, if you will. So, yeah, that that was another kind of unintended consequence that it is a little bit like, you know, umbrella insurance kind of Mm -hmm. full coverage kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, we've, we've touched on the fact that you're, you're, a technology company and if you weren't or or some type of technology company it would be weird to have you here but uh let's let's talk about um let's talk about what you do so you're not you're not a vendor to msps uh not intentionally or specifically i mean we are an msp uh, but given my background so maybe it makes sense to cover that a little bit so yeah this this is probably Depends on how you look at it. My fourth or fifth uh, startup since I was a teenager. Um, Previous to this, I was the CTO at Green Cloud Technologies. And I think there's a chance we actually spoke on one of your podcasts once in the past uh, years ago when I was there. So uh, prior to that, I was the head of engineering for a um, large CLEC, uh, which is now Windstream. Um, And then at the very beginning, when I was a teenager, I started an ISP uh, in the 90s um, called Carolina Online down here in the in South Carolina. So the interesting thing and why I I went through all that was all of those businesses were channel focused. We always sold through the channel. Um, So since the very beginning, I've had very tight connection with managed service providers, you know, at the time in the 90s, computer stores, break fix people, telecom agents, you know, the the basically the technology reseller community. Um, but I always saw it from kind of the outside as the vendor. Um, and a lot of times all the way within the engineering organization, uh, kind of as my career progressed, I've moved more towards front facing you know, doing more sales and marketing and, and uh, still doing the, the technology side of things and the, the engineering, but being that uh, uh, progressed into, you know, kind of managing the whole company more and more over time. Uh, I, I saw a lot of, you know, I guess you could say what, what people do right and what people do wrong, but more really what was working 
um, for some MSPs and, and what was not working for others. And then I also saw the challenge a lot of uh, MSPs were going through in the recent years, um, you know, transitioning to cloud and security services. Um, you know, there was the first big transition from break fix to monthly recurring um, services and VCIO and all those kind of MSP 2.0 things. Um, mm-hmm. It feels like there's another one going on now. You know, I used to always talk about uh, MSP 3.0 or, you know, kind of the cloud managed service provider or the MSSP type model, you know, all of those things. So uh, long story short. I feel, like, I feel like those two are very different things though. Yeah. Yeah, they are. I, my, my point was it's kind of, there's a third direction people are going, you know, where, they either decided to, um, you know, in-house progress to cloud and security, or people have specialized off from being an MSSP, I mean, MSP to uh, something like an MSSP or a cloud service provider and selling back into the MSP community now. Um, but the bottom line is cloud and security has become a big part of, you know, the, the progression. Um, so I saw that and, um, I've always been a very, a lot of people say this, but I've always been a very customer centric kind of empathetic personality. Like I, I want to know what people are concerned about and what's working and what's not and solve those technology problems as opposed to sitting way back in an engineering organization and kind of guessing what's wrong out there and what products need to exist. So I kind of wanted to get back to the customer um, again and so that's what Umbrella is. Umbrella is a kind of a full turnkey MSP. Um, we do security mm-hmm. services all the way to physical security, you know, cameras, access control, all that kind of stuff. Cybersecurity, obviously, compliance. Um, and then I'm still obviously a big cloud advocate. Um, I'm still an investor in Green Cloud. Um, so we use Green Cloud, Azure, um, Google, those services as well. And then all the traditional, you know, managed services where we're managing the infrastructure. Uh, but we, we kind of take a different angle is what I tried to do, where we come in and be very consultative from a uh, extreme aspect where like we actually come in and say, you know, our sales process is kind of what's working for you and IT um, which generally makes people tell you everything that's not working in IT as opposed to what's working. Um, and then we, we say, okay, well, we're going to fix those top two items for free, right? We're, we're going to come in. This isn't a technology evaluation. This isn't a security assessment. A lot of the things that everybody's doing, this is a, let us prove to you. We know what we're doing. We're going to take away your two biggest pains for no charge. And, you know, obviously there's caveats within reason what we can do there, but, um, that's the angle we want. We want to be seen as enhancing someone's business, not just being their IT department. Um, so to circle back to your question, you know, we, we also do that for other MSPs. So if, if you've got an MSP who um, doesn't feel comfortable with the cloud side of things or doesn't feel comfortable with compliance or some of those areas like that, um, we can augment um, and, and we have done that. It's not our core business, um, but it is something that uh, I have a lot of background, like I said, from being in the channel community that I can bring those things to bear and help people create a practice potentially, um, if not augment it myself. But, uh, you know, the core business is serving small business. Um, the other thing I'm doing that uh, I think will kind of differentiate um, I don't know if this is relevant to the whole community out there, but I call it the Chick-fil-A model. So basically we are uh, building uh, markets. I, I, I define a market as an area code, basically as a, as a dividing line. And I'm hiring people um, with the intent that you are coming into this company to be management in the future, right? So whether you come in as a tech or you come in as a, service delivery person, or you come in as a salesperson or someone in accounting or administrative, um, your goal is to learn the other facets of the business. Your goal is to learn how the financial side of things works. Your goal is to learn how, 
you know, customer services and account management works. And one day you will be given an area code and you'll be the general manager and build a environment with support back from corporate. Um, so it's two facets of what I call the Chick-fil-A model. That's how Chick-fil-A works. None of the individual restaurants are owned by the, you know, general manager. They're owned by the mm -hmm. corporation and everybody who is a general manager started all the way as someone at the register, you know, and it's a way to keep it where everyone cares, right? You know, they, they feel like it's more their business and I'm able to, um, you know, keep the concept of, we liked working with Eric, you know, he really seemed to care because it was his business and they keep that feeling with, you know, everybody I hire because they feel that way too. They're getting a percentage of our EBITDA as they grow and things like that. So I really, I did this kind of as, like I said, seeing best practices from a lot of MSPs. So I'm implementing them for myself, but I'm also kind of in the business of consulting to others to help them implement these practices as well as they prove themselves out. Okay. So, so let's talk about kind of the thing that, it's it's almost I'm almost sick of talking about it, okay? Mm -hmm. But let's let's talk about cybersecurity for a little bit. Sure. Um, I I see it up on your website. You know, it's it's up in the top three column area of mm -hmm. your services: cybersecurity, innovative technology backed by your own two hundred and fifty thousand dollars cyber insurance policy. Yeah, so that's that's another thing we did. Um, we actually partnered with Chubb insurance. Um, they okay. have the Cyurance um, subsidiary, and we were one of the first partners in that organization. So one of the things we thought about is um, people are used to the concept of insurance as a solution, right? If it's a problem that you think is very unlikely, how you usually solve it is buying an insurance policy, right? You know, you don't, you don't, uh, go out of your way to come up with um, flood and, and fire protection. You do what's required by code and then you buy insurance for it. So the same thing here, um, we're able to resell Cyurance's policies based on the fact that we put in basic cybersecurity practices, you know, a firewall, intrusion detection, EDR agents on their machines because of that, the policy is less expensive because they know their risk is less. Mm -hmm. So it's twofold. One, if, if it's something that the customer sees as a value, we can focus on the insurance angle um, and it gets them to do something about cybersecurity because we don't just sell the insurance. We're going to also uh, put in new equipment, start monitoring and things like that, mm -hmm. or they can't get the policy. So um a lot of what we've tried to do is come up with ways to present a lot of these things a little differently because, you know, everybody knows this. If, if you've got to spend your time to convince somebody they need something, they're not going to buy it because they don't believe they need it. I mean, if you're, if you're having to convince them that it's important and they don't already believe it, your chances of making them think it's important are very slim. So trying to find angles that are relatable to them and make sense is something we've, we've been trying to, to do a lot of, you know, with healthcare, um, some of the secondary healthcare, we take the angle of continuing education, for instance. Um, you know, they're all used to going and getting recertified on a lot of the things they do. So we, we call it uh, cybersecurity hygiene, right? Because it's something they relate to. And we do continuing education in the form of bite-sized training that comes to them in email. We do lunch and learns and come in and, they get a you know certificate that, that says they are you know participating in a ongoing cybersecurity program, which again is something very familiar to them. Around you know if it's a dentist office, they have to do hygiene, continuing education. They've had to go through all kinds of uh, enhanced education and changes related to PPF for COVID. So it's you know, insurance and education and some of those components that aren't traditionally included in an IT setting, we're trying to include those not only because they're important, but because those are more relatable to people. And it's something that makes them more comfortable with the rest of the solution. 
Now, you said PPF. I'm familiar with uh, personal protective equipment. PPE. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I meant PPE. <laughs> okay. It was just a slip. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, that's been another interesting, you know, scenario as well. Uh, we have a dentist office, for instance, that, um, they were using a lot of alternative ways to authenticate any, you know, biometrics and things like that. But once they started wearing masks and shields and gloves and full gowns, a lot of that stuff was, was no longer feasible. Um, so we actually moved to where they wear, uh, an NFC bracelet that authenticates them um, so that they can just, you know, tap their computer. It, uh, you authenticate once in the morning using that band to prove it's you. And then from then on, simply tapping the band um, logs them in, it logs them in and out of doors. Um, hmm. So things like that, trying to, I've been trying to, uh, you know, we as a team have been trying to go in and find out, you know, what is it that really, I mean, that's the questions we ask. What is most annoying to you about technology? What have you learned to accept that you should not have to accept? Because it really blows my mind the number of things people have accepted about technology. You know, if you're a nerd, you don't accept something annoying that happens every time you find a way to fix it. Your typical user, they just accept that, well, I have to log in 50 times a day and it never gets any easier. Or this process takes Mm -hmm. three minutes every time I do it, but that's just how it's always been. So it must be right. You know, we try to identify those things up front. If you solve those type problems, then people are much more willing to let you work on the things that um, need to be fixed but are not important to them, right? A lot of the back end cybersecurity stuff and everything else. So, again, we've just been trying to find ways to to make the uh, relationship form quicker, get the trust there so that you can do a lot of these back office cybersecurity stuff, you know, things that, that people are just, it's not going to happen to me type mentality. Um, but it, it's getting, it's getting to the point where it is happening to them and it's happening to everybody they know. Um, but even at that, they're not sure what to do, you know, so you, you got to kind of get in that trusted advisor space, which is as much as I'm a technologist and have been on the engineering side, I try to stay away from talking about technology solutions to problems and talking to them more about the mentality and that kind of stuff they need to have um, because they're tired of being talked down to. They're tired of being confused all the time. All right. So uh, one second. So for those of you that um, are just joining us or or joined us a little later, um, I'm I'm, I'm speaking with Eric Hester, uh, owner of the MSP Umbrella Technology Group. And um, we're, I, if you have questions, if, we're, if you're watching this live, please toss them in the comments. Yeah, please, please. And, you know, we will get to those as we can. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, I want to know more about this NFC bracelet thing. Sure. So there's a couple different varieties. You can go really complicated or pretty straightforward. So the most straightforward version is really just a, um, and I don't have one right with me or I would show you, but it basically looks like one of the Livestrong bracelets or something, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's rubbery um, and it just has an NFC chip in it. Um, and thus, like I said, the simplest version, you actually authenticate, um, you know, the first time you log in, uh, you use your, you click your band, and then you actually use your AD credentials to log in, um, and then that ties. You know, th- the band is already tied to your authentication, but that ties the fact that a human took the effort to log in. It's kind of a multi-factor initial authentication. So now, for your, you know, unlocking your screen, re-authenticating to Windows, you just have to click the band. There's a USB dongle that gets it hangs off the side of all the monitors or tablets or whatever the user is using, and they just hmm. authenticate that way. And then, like I said, we're also using an NFC-based uh, access control system for the doors. So you also just click the card readers, you know, with your armband, so you don't have to take your gloves off or go in your pocket or touch anything that's not sure. Um, there is another but, version which is more. But expensive. isn't there? Isn't that kind of a security risk in itself? Because, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love 
gadgety you know i would i would buy these all day long just because they're cool you know yep. but now isn't there a risk that okay i've authenticated and now an intruder comes into the building and and takes my bracelet off of yep so that's what i was getting there is a it depends on the vulnerability level uh, you know how secure is the the back office where these are like one of the places that uses them heavily is a lab doing testing all the area they're in there working is a secured area. Nobody's coming in and out of there anyway. It's really there to speed up their authentication more than anything because they're having mm-hmm. to do a chain of custody. So they have to, every time they do something, they have to authenticate again and authenticate again to prove it was them doing it. Um, same thing with even like a dentist. Every time they go in and put something new in the chart, they have to authenticate again to prove it was them putting it in the chart. Mm-hmm. So it's not as much about, um, protecting them from access to the machine as speeding up the process because the physical door access controls and cameras and all those things, physical access is supposed to limit a lot of that. But if we get into a scenario where it's extremely uh, imperative that that not happen, what you just described, they make another type of armband that it basically is almost like a smart watch. Um, You put it it on when it's been removed. Yeah. And it, it, it actually, detects your heart rate um, and your skin temperature and everything. And when you take it off, it de-authenticates. So you authenticate the same way I just described in the morning and you're good until you take it off again or whatever timeout you put on there. But if somebody Mm -hmm. removes it and, you know, even if they cut your hand off, which let's be honest, that's an extreme example, your heart rate would stop then. So you you couldn't remove it. Um, Those are very expensive though. And again, most of these places are using, you know, you kind of got to pick your battles in some cases. It's it's such a vast improvement over what they were doing before. Um, you know, eventually, yes, I would like to move them to, a, you know, the next level of, of that. Maybe make them have to do a, uh, you know, a multi-factor pin or something like that in addition to it. Um, but, you know, considering they a lot of times in, in one case, they weren't even logging into their machines at all. You know, they had a machine level login that auto logged in when they came in in the morning. It was, you know, so you kind of got to look at the extremes of what you're doing and move them. And that's another thing I'm trying to do is move people as slowly as I can towards these solutions so that they don't resist. Um, You know, obviously I could have made that a lot more secure, but, you know, I've had scenarios where I, I did that and people said, turn this off. I can't do my job. You know, this is ridiculous. I don't want to deal with this all day long. So um, it's a compromise, you know, that's always the challenge with security. Um, but we also augment that, like I said, with security awareness training where um, we're making sure they understand that you don't want to let someone uh, manipulate, manipulate you into getting into an area they should not be. You know, we'll do tests where um, I, I go to Goodwill and you can get a shirt from, pretty much any vendor you want. So I'll get one from the local cable company, basically come in with a clipboard before anybody knows who I am. And 99% of the time I can get into their wiring closet or server room or whatever's relevant because I tell them, you know, we're doing a free promotion to upgrade your uh, internet. We just need to look at your modem, make sure we don't need to order a new one for you. If you could just give me a second to go back there um, and they'll, you know, let you in and walk away. So explaining to them that things like that are, are just as dangerous as getting a computer virus. Um, and everybody always says, well, why would they do that to me? Well, because you care about your data, right? Even if even if they don't think they could sell it to somebody, the idea of ransomware and all that stuff has, has at least made people start to understand that if you think you're just some little old dentist uh, office in South Carolina and you're safe because of you know security by obscurity, That's not true. You absolutely could have somebody walk into your business to steal records. And once you make them understand things like that, they're a lot more protective of those armbands. They're a lot more protective of their workstation. They understand why you're locking it. Um, Because, you know, once they understand that they could, the business they work for could go out of business if they don't take care of this and you make it real to them. Um, You know, They have to participate, I guess is what I'm saying. So that armband, yeah, they absolutely could have it removed. The chances someone's going to come in by force and try to remove it from them is less likely than them 
taking it off and leaving it on a table somewhere. So, you know, if we can educate them to actively participate in this more, that removes the vast majority of those type of risks. So, all right. So the bracelets, how much are the, the cheap rubbery live strong ones? Um, I order them in bulk from, from China to be sure. honest. And they're, you know, oh, okay. You know, they're a, they're a couple of bucks. Um, the expensive one, you know, you're talking, uh, eight or $900 a piece. Um, got it. and then you got to put the card readers into all the machines. Um, those are hundred bucks or so. And then obviously the access control system for the building varies on what system you put in and, and uh, how many doors and all that kind of stuff. So it's not an overwhelming expense for them to do it. And, um, it's been very well received. Um, you know, the other thing is obviously dentists and doctors and lawyers and, um, accountants and those types, they actually really like showing off their technology to each other. <laughs> and it's a very visible thing they can show their peers. You know, look, I have this now. And this is how I authenticate and log into my office. And, you know, what are you doing for that? Yeah. And it, 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 sell, it goes out there and sells for you and markets pretty well because it's a visible uh, instance of cybersecurity that, you know, is tangible. It's something they can show versus, well, they installed some software. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it does, but they say it makes me secure. You know, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. They can hold out their iPhone and show them the cameras that they have at their office and what motion events have occurred and who came in the doors. And right. Again, physical security and a lot of those things is not something you typically think of as what an MSP needs to be doing. But it's hard to have cybersecurity taken care of if you don't have physical security taken care of, like we just described. And two, a lot of this is about perception. And if you can get them to perceive that that they are now more secure and talk to their peers about it, you'll get more business, you'll get more people mm-hmm. to participate. And this is all about getting people to participate. You know, if they feel like Oh yeah, and, and I think we as MSPs all all understand that. Yeah. Um so that's that's honestly, that's exactly why I wanted to know more about these wristbands, just because I think this is a neat idea. I mean yeah. I never thought of that. And and I'm not saying that like I didn't I didn't know anything like this existed because I'm pretty sure just about anything exists at this point. Uh, you know, if if you can think of it and it's and it's something that, you know, NFC wristbands, like of course China's already made it, you know, right. like <laughs> Well, and it, it, so it, that's a good point. That's 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 an example of what I'm trying to do. So when we come in in the beginning, we do actual user studies is what we do. We say, what are the roles you have in your business, right? And then we sit down with one of each of those roles. And that's how we discovered this. We watched a hygienist at a dentist have to take their gloves off, type on the computer, put more gloves back on, remove their mask to authenticate on their phone. And, you know, it was like, Good Lord, they're doing and that that's, 40 times that's a day. That's a lot of time wasted. And if yeah. you think about it, like they probably have to, to waste a lot of pairs of gloves doing yeah. that. So, I mean, selling them selling them this NFC thing is probably a, a drop in the bucket. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a big upfront cost. But when you show them, hey, look, you know, you've got all this PPE we don't know when when all of these ridiculous requirements are going away. How how much are you spending in PPE on a daily basis? Yep. Um, and then break it down for them, and then you can show them. Oh well, here's your ROI by just buying X, Y, and Z from me. Yep. Um, you know that makes it real easy. And and what's really cool, like you know, while we're talking, I I Google searched, I found shopnfc.com, and this website. I mean, they've got everything, man. Like they've even got, so when you look at the wristbands, they've even got those disposable ones, the kinds that you'd, you'd get as yep. like a patient. So, so now yeah, they can we'll even... give those to vendors when they come in sometimes, you know, yeah. that's the other thing. Like we, we can now give them to their janitor, their UPS driver. They all have those and those are time limited to get into the building and only into certain doors. Um, you know, you've always been able to give people cards and stuff, but it's another thing. It's harder for them to lose if it's a you know wristband and stuff they can throw on in the morning. Um, and I, I've actually got enough that I've got UPS drivers that I can 
have them have one armband and let them in multiple of my customers. So you know, there's interesting stuff like that, that, that was not the intent of it at all, but um, it's just, I mean, I've got a numerous list of examples just like this where I would have never thought about this had I not sat down and watched a user fumble around. And like you said, efficiency is something that drives me crazy. If I see somebody being incredibly inefficient, like I said earlier, if, if their practice management software takes five minutes to do something every time they do it and they've accepted that over the last 12 years or whatever, that just blows my mind and I have to fix it right mm-hmm. away. Um, because if that's happening to them 20 times a day, that's you know an hour that they've wasted uh, waiting on software. And that's just asinine to me that, that people have learned to accept that. And, you know, I think you wouldn't necessarily find that if you just said, we're going to come in, we'll install our RMM tool. We're going to install our EDR agent. You know, we're going to upgrade you to the latest windows 10. We're going to run, um, you know, some of the optimization stuff, but if you don't really sit down with somebody and look at how they're using the computer, they're probably not going to see much efficiency gain or anything from that other than, you know, when they're running out of disk space or something, right? That's, that's not, I think a lot of times people look at it from the wrong angle. Like, have you improved the user experience? If you haven't improved the user experience, they're not going to want to keep paying you, right? If you've checked Mm -hmm. off your boxes as an MSP that, well, I'm now monitoring all their systems. They've got an EDR tool on there, a malware tool of some kind. um, And I put in a new firewall. A lot of times that checks all your boxes. I did something to make their network better. Well, you got to ask yourself, what changed for them? Do they have anything that's better today than it was before? Probably not. That probably didn't change anything. If anything, some of that might have made their experience slower or more cumbersome. Um, so, you know, I'm not saying it's just like you said, I didn't come up with something amazing new technology by using an armband. But I do think it, it's a new application of it that, you know, is not being commonly thought of. And it's not something I do at every customer. There's other scenarios that, you know, I've solved problems for an accountant versus them or something like that using a totally different solution. So um, I just that's that's me. Anybody that knows me, I love gadgets. I love trying to find ways to make technology useful and consumable, not just technology for technology's sake. Awesome. So you you said you've partnered with uh, Chubb. And and they're they're the company that owns Psy Insurance. I've never heard of Psy Insurance. Correct. I Maybe think they should. started up last year. Um, I mean, obviously Chubb Insurance is huge and more mm-hmm. European and everything, but it it's been around for a long time. But they they spun off. I don't know if they acquired it or spun it off or what the situation was. Um, but they created Psy Insurance with the idea of being just cybersecurity and errors and emissions um, type insurance. And it's interesting um, not to be an ad for them, but as part of partnering with them, you get a really good deal on your tech E&O insurance along with a, I think it's, uh, there's different levels. I think it starts at like $750,000 of cybersecurity up to 2 million. Um, And then, like I said, it also has your errors and emissions insurance and it covers data loss and a lot of, a lot of stuff. And it's relatively, I mean, as insurance goes, relatively inexpensive. Um, you get that for yourself, and then you get the ability to sell these policies, which, as long as people fall into lower risk um, industries, unlike you know healthcare and some of those, it's a cookie cutter. Um, policy that they do not have to go through any extensive application process. They literally fill out one web page form, submit it, and they're then authorized. And they'll either bill them directly or you can bill them. Um, and so the only challenge is there's weird regulations around you can't upcharge for insurance. Um, so you have to call it out as an individual line item somehow mm-hmm. on your bundle it in. Um, so there's some weird things like that, but like I said, it's been very productive to differentiate myself. Um, and it's another tangible thing, you know, more tangible anyway, uh, as it relates to the service that people can point to, as opposed to all the intangible technology things we do behind the scenes that nobody 
really gives us enough credit for, you know, insurance. They understand, they understand its value. Um, and then, like I said, it's always been the case that, you know, you want to do a lot of reports and you want to do a lot of stuff to smack people in the face with, I'm doing something for you. I'm doing something for you. Um, because if you're doing it right, you're, you become invisible. Mm-hmm. So I think these are more of those things that, you know, just trying to find ways to remind them, uh, of what the value is. Um, because I'll be honest, I've, I've over the years, I think what we do is so akin to insurance sales. <laughs> it's crazy. So do I, man. I think you really, you really have to, you have to make people, um, value something that has not happened to them yet and make them understand the impact it will have if it does happen and the cost of inaction. Um, and, you know, I, I do not envy someone who does only insurance sales for their life because it's, it's very challenging. It, you know, this is an event driven business almost. If they've had something happen, then it's very easy to explain to them why they need all this stuff. If they haven't had it happen, if they haven't had any data loss, if they haven't had a ransomware attack, if they haven't, you know, um, had any significant hardware failure, if they haven't had anybody, you know, steal data, none of these things have happened. They all sound like far-fetched nerd speak to these people. You know, it's not something that's going to happen to me. That's just something you spend all your time thinking about. So you think it's going to happen to everybody, you know, whereas if they've had something happen to them, um, and, you know, we all take angles of things like, well, let's show them, you know, we'll do a security audit and we'll, you know, do things like ID agent and do dark web searches and all those things, which, you know, sometimes that helps, but then it also just seems like, well, of course you can find some evidence that validates what you say, you know, you're trying to sell me something. Um, so I've just been trying as many things as I can to, you know, for two reasons. One, I want to actually provide some of these alternative services, but two, you know, everybody in the MSP space knows it's really hard to shorten the cycle and get people to understand that, um, you know, there's more to this than we're just going to install a bunch of boxes, just like the last guy that installed a bunch of boxes that didn't work for you. Hmm. So now I'm, I'm dying to know what other <laughs> fun gadgets have you played with, man? Like, so, um, well, I mean, I, think, I like toys. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of the other stuff is more traditional, but it's just, again, being willing to accept kind of a lesser role, doing something that may be, you know, out of your core competency, um, but just to get to business. So we did a lot of uh, work on building, you know, Zoom rooms and Teams rooms. Um, there's some really cool stuff um, that you can, once you get deeper into Teams rooms, for instance, and you build your own boxes and you can manipulate the config through uh, AD and that kind of stuff. They've got, for instance, a whiteboard set up now where if you place a uh, 4K camera um, pointing at your whiteboards, basically, it doesn't even have to be straight on. Um, when you switch and say share whiteboard, it takes basically it takes a still picture to get a mask of what's on the screen. And then when you walk in front of it, you're transparent. So you can still see what was written on the board, you know, through someone's head and through their hand. That's cool. Um, so, you know, that plays really well for large. Um, we have a, uh, can't say who it is. We have a big shoe company here, put it that way. You would know, definitely know who it is. Um, they had 18 conference rooms and, you know, they were looking because now everything's shifted to, they're talking to their customers and clients and, sponsored athletes and all those kind of things. Um, so they wanted a really nice uh, video conferencing set up for all of the rooms. So basically it's the normal thing. You know, you've got two screens for uh, showing the people and the content and then big whiteboards with those cameras so they can do that. And then a uh, either a Logitech or Creston um, control pad on the table and then beam forming microphones and things like that. So, Again, I don't want to be an AV nerd and install conference rooms everywhere um, because the margins aren't huge. I mean, you, you can only do so much there, but you are selling them teams then, which gets you into 365, which gets you into, 
um, you know, now getting your way back into the, the, the core of the organization. Um, and again, it's another thing that shows really well. I mean, you can make money off of it. Don't get me wrong, but it's, mm-hmm. it, it, that would be an old whole business into itself. So that's one thing. Um, I think the other that uh, has shown really well is I was an early beta tester for the ubiquity uh, unify access product. So that's actually what we're using for door control and working with uh, that for um, smaller businesses. I don't know how well it scales, but it's actually really cool how it works because you have a controller you put in. It's a POE. It's a box that you just plug in POE and then you plug in the door controller, your magnet, your key strike, all that to it there. And it's powered by POE. So you don't have to run all the other low voltage structured cabling over to it. You just run your same old cat five over. Um, and then it's all controlled through the unify controller where unify protect is and unify network. If you're using that for their Wi-Fi, which that's what we use for, you know, the network and Wi-Fi and unify protect for the cameras it's nice again because they get a, you know, you can give them an iPhone app. They can look at their cameras really easily. They can look at all their door records um, right there. Also looking at their, you know, Wi-Fi and that side of things. So that's been another one. They have a nice uh, door doorbell unit that uh, also is a card reader. They can put pin codes in if they forget their um, card or badge or you know wrist, wrist bracelet or whatever. Um, you also then can do pin codes for vendors and things like that to come in. And then it, it also, you know, does cutesy things like says, hello, Eric, when you open the door and stuff, you know, again, necessary, no, but it sure makes them happy that they got something cool. I mean, they literally sure. were their friends to show them it say their name, you know, it's, um, so that's, that's been, you know, Unify has its own. I'm sure everybody on here, there's probably some that are groaning at that because, you know, Ubiquity has its set of problems. Don't get me wrong. Um, sure. But for smaller stuff, it, it really does help you get in there quickly and easy. And you can scale it later, um, you know, to some of the, the higher end products. But again, it's more about getting them started and doing something. And the, the barrier to entry is much lower with that. Because again, you don't have to do a big structured wiring job to run all the low voltage cabling everywhere. You're just running your Cat5 when you're running the other or Cat6, whatever. Hmm. Um, so that's another one. We'll see. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff I don't think is is incredibly unique as far as what it is. It's just like you said, it's all out there. It's just figuring out, you know, what it is that uh, bothers them the most. Uh, another thing that we've done uh, is for restaurants um, that are bringing back live music and things like that, a lot of them now will – have live music in an area of the restaurant that uh, isn't even open and they're streaming it. So they'll have it on the TVs and they'll have it on their Facebook page. So just putting in a, hmm. you know, a camera and setting up OBS for them and, you know, letting them have a, a streaming setup again, then that gets us in there where we can do their point of sale business and, you know, that side of thing. So I try a lot of Trojan horse stuff. You know, it's, 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 um, you know, from my purview, like I said, of being at a channel vendor, um, I think you got to do a lot of these kind of things just to get in there. It's all about trust. I mean, when you're a channel vendor, you're looking and you're saying, the reason I'm using MSPs as my sales channel is they already have the relationship and they already have the trust with the customer, right? Well, that's not easily built. We all know that, right? So No, it's not. I've been, I've watched, and you know, it it is easily destroyed. It's super easily destroyed, which is why I say, you know, as painful as it is looking at your spreadsheets and your reports on PL that you don't have the, you know, MRC that you wish you had um, for that customer yet. If you slowly build it by some of these things, you do much less damage, you know, early on by trying to do too much too fast. Um, you know, believe me, I'd love to have, uh, you know, a 200, 250 per user, you know, run rate on everybody. But, you know, good luck. You're not going to just get there day one, if ever, maybe. But um, if I can get, uh, you know, $10 a user 
doing one of these other things just to get started, I'll very quickly get it up to 50 and then 75. Um, whereas if I tried to start at 75, I would have never gotten there. Um, and I don't know if that's common for everybody, but it's certainly in my market is what I've seen so far. And it's kind of what I saw looking from green cloud down a lot of times and from the telecom side down. So how many, um, how many staff do you have right now? Uh, right now we're just three people. Um, I have, I bring in, um, I'm actually on the advisory board for one of the colleges here that has a cybersecurity program. Um, so I bring in a lot of interns, um, is how I try to offset that. Um, so, you know, a lot of this is, again, I'm willing to experiment for a long period of time because my game plan is building out a regional, um, that's based on these, you know, individual markets. So, Sure. A lot of what I'm doing right now is experimentation to see what works, a lot of A-B testing to see, you know, what I want to do more of. So I haven't scaled the the business very far with individual, you know, growth there. I did sure. initially build a SOC, um, you know, physical space that I was going to staff with, uh, you know, the normal um, pool of folks, but then COVID hit and, you know, number one, I don't think anybody cares what your office looks like anymore. You know, I don't think not even a little. You know, no, nobody even asks what, you know, show me pictures of your knock. You know, that's not even somebody even knows to ask anymore. And not only that, they fully expect that. If you they work. do, you just you just go to one of those uh, stock image sites. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, I have pictures of the one I built now. So it's it's basically stock, but I don't have it anymore. But, yeah. Well, but you know, just send me a copy of that and. <laughs> I'll, I'll send that to my people too. I mean, it'll be perfect. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's, 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 um, you know, it's something I wish I could tell you I had 20 people and we're churning out, you know, 10 grand of new MRR a month. That That's not where we are. That's where we're headed. A lot of where I am, you know, this really, I started this last March, like a maniac, right? When COVID hit, um, I uh, wish someone had given me a memo ahead of time, but um, I think so, technically there was a memo. Yeah. Just, you know, here on the east side of the states, <laughs> we just didn't think that it would ever come this far. Well, I, I had already started the process, done a lot of my initial investment, and I kind of had that opinion of like, well, I've kind of put enough gas on the fire now. Stopping it would be a huge waste. So let's just hope this yeah. only lasts for a few months, um, when, which is what felt like worst case at the time. Um, but... What I've done Can you believe instead, it's been a year. Yeah, no, I can't. But what's been good about it is, like I said, doing a lot of the research and seeing mm. it's made me do the hard thing, which is, you know, try things, figure out what works, get better. And then once you've got yourself really polished, then pour the gas on it um, and get out there where you can build your reputation based on doing the right things that more people want. And that's where we are now. Um, you know, we're getting a lot better response from everybody when we're coming out there. I don't know. It, it's definitely a combination. One, um, the world has opened up a lot more as far as people being more receptive this year to taking meetings and, and stuff like that. But two, I think we have a better story now that that uh, resonates more. Um, sure. So it's it's you know, it's like everybody. It's what I tell people all the time, you know, who, who want to start a business it's not like you have a good idea and you just start making money the first week. You know, it's a years and years process. And as long as you are progressing and you feel like, you know, your plan is proving out whether it's slowly or not, you just keep going. Right. And you just keep going no matter how much it hurts. And, uh, you know, it's starting to hurt less. It's kind of where we are. Um, so, you know, that's why I said, I, I don't consider myself, you know, the, number one most successful MSP in the world by any means because I'm not yet. And I don't necessarily say that I have all the ideas figured out, but um, I do have some interesting angles, like I said, from looking at it from the vendor perspective for a long time. Um, you know, and we worked very heavily. Green Cloud's philosophy is to sell beside the um, partner. So we had a lot of end user meetings and I was the CTO mm. and you know, I'd get pulled in on a lot of them whether it's for the name or, or whatever it happened for. But um, so I saw all across the country, you know, what worked and what didn't and what seems to resonate and what doesn't. Um, so, you know, 
I'm, I'm trying to leverage that and I'm happy to, to help other people leverage that as well. I, I want to see this work. I mean, like I said, I'm a huge advocate of, I love technology. I'm willing to experiment with things before they're really ready for prime time, but you know, end users aren't, it needs to work. It needs to be something that makes their life better. And like we were talking about that armband thing. I mean, that just makes me giddy how happy they are. And they all show it to me when I come in, you know, like they think it's, that's something that made their life considerably better. Um, and it's a good example of something that when I was starting this, I didn't think about that at all. Like I wasn't thinking about how I was going to do physical Ooh, security. Right. I wasn't thinking about how I was going to do, how can you make login during COVID better? Uh, wouldn't even have thought of that as a thing. So, so let's, let's rewind quite a bit. Okay. Um, you started an ISP <laughs> as a teenager. Correct. Now, now you said that was in the 90s? Yeah, it was, I started it in 93. Okay. So, uh, full disclosure, uh, 93, I was like, you know, nine years old. Okay, So, <laughs> you know, you, you got a little bit on me, yeah. but I, I think we're close enough that, you know, I, I remember the 90s. Now, now at like nine years old, AOL was a was kind of popular in ninety three, mm -hmm. right? But but like DSL wasn't a thing yet. No, DSL. D so and it's funny. DSL didn't get popular they, until like ninety eight, ninety nine, right? Right. So my partners and I, you know, what we called the ISP Carolina Online. We did it very intentionally because we wanted. That's what people thought of was the internet was America online. So by creating Carolina online, we were making a more localized personal version of the internet. And people really thought that, I mean, that was a marketing bonanza that we did that people thought basically they were getting America online by doing it. So, um, that is hilarious. We, um, yeah, we, we were in, um, so I'm in Greenville, South Carolina, which is the Western part mountain, you know, foothills, of the mountains, um, mm -hmm. and there was nothing, you know, internet wise being built here in the nineties. Um, and it actually came out of, um, when I graduated high school, I went to Clemson university, which is right here. And mm -hmm. the, um, provost of the school, they had put in, I think we actually had a, uh, 56 K internet connection at that point, um, for the whole school. Um, but they had put for that sure. in. Yeah, everybody. But there was no, I mean, I'm really starting to feel old now, but there literally was no web browsers. This was all using like FTP and Gopher and email and stuff like that. There was no, I installed the first, you know, web browsers and NCSA web server for www.clemson.edu and stuff back then. And nobody knew why you would have a web page or anything else. So I don't want to sound like back in my day, so I'm going to stop that. But the, uh, the, um, president of the university basically said we've got tons of off-campus housing and people are going to need access to the network. It wasn't even the internet at the time. They were just going to need access to the network because email and actually sharing uh, documentation, stuff like that between the professors and the, you know, academic side was, was becoming a bigger thing. So he put together a team to build an internet provider basically, for, you know, for off-campus. And I was on that team and, um, they decided not to do it, but we had already figured it out. So, you know, people were selling their cars and refinancing their home and doing whatever they could for us to get enough money, um, to start the ISP. So it was me and four other guys. Um, and so we started it with our awesome. money like that. We built it up to about, uh, 40,000 users. And then we sold that to a, um, to your point around 99, DSL was really starting to kick off and we had to make a decision of whether or not we were going to put in DSL equipment and spend millions of dollars, um, you know, building out our own network to do it or, you know, just merge with somebody else like at the time mm -hmm. Bell or, or whatever who needed internet. So at the same time, local phone service got deregulated and we got uh, purchased by a company that was going to become a competitive local exchange carrier. Um, and that was Nuvox Communications, which eventually became Windstream. 
Um, hmm. We were the, you know, data network side of a telephone company who knew nothing about the internet or what, you know, why you would do that. Um, so it was, it was really fun. We built it out all the way through, you know, the frame relay ATM days to building out the, one of the, one of the largest MPLS networks that was built early on. I think. Uh, That's so cool. Um, and, you know, at the time I was in my twenties, just getting these, multi-million dollar pieces of equipment that nobody knew what to do with. And then we'd figure out how to make them work, you know, and then built a big VoIP network. And so, you know, that's always been my thing is to figure out these, you know, burgeoning technologies, how to, how to make them usable and consumable. And uh, sure. it's been a lot of fun. But then that's when, so, after that, we, we, in 2011, uh, several of us from Nuvox left and started green cloud now focusing on the cloud technologies and doing a lot of the same things. So we built out mm -hmm. data centers all over the U S and, and sold that through the channel to the same people that we had been working with for internet and phone. All right. So I want to get to new, uh, to green cloud in a, in a moment. Um, let's stay on the ISP here. Sure. So, you know, you're, you're talking about buying like millions of dollars worth of equipment. You're, 40,000 subscribers mm -hmm. and you were charging each subscriber like $20 or more a month, right? Yeah. Well, it had just changed, you know, <laughs> when we first started, you paid per um, minute. minute. Yeah. Oh, so you wow. would pay us like $9 and then God, I can't even remember how much it was a minute. So we did all usage based billing, but in around 90, it's 97, 98. We changed to 1999 unlimited because that's what everybody had done. Um, right. So, yeah, it was it was a pretty good revenue stream. There's no doubt. Um, but it was also so, very, I mean, we had massive modem pools, um, server farms to do. I mean, we did it all ourselves. We weren't outsourcing anything to anybody, you know, so. So there's a lot of IT people that don't really understand how an ISP works. Um, and I'll be honest, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of in that boat. Like I, I even went and took a tour of a, of a smaller ISP mm -hmm. and I still just didn't get it with some of the things. So like, um, let's, let's just take my, my home situation here. Okay. okay? So I, um, I live in Medina, Ohio mm -hmm. and I am thankful that I don't have Spectrum or Cox or any of those. Mm -hmm. I have a little company called Armstrong. Okay. And uh, they're fantastic. You know, I pay, I don't know, 110, 120 bucks a month and I get gigabit down. Awesome. Um, and, and then I think I get like 25 meg up or something like, you know, the, the upload, who cares, whatever, you know, I, I upload a few ter a few gigabytes to YouTube every week, otherwise, whatever. Right. Um, so I've got a gigabit. My neighbor's got a gigabit. Well, no, let's, let's be honest. Most of my neighbors are probably on the 200 meg. Right. You know, everyone's on, everyone's on the cost effective one. I'm the only nut that thinks he needs a gig. Right. Um, but like, okay, so we all connect to that, you know, it's like that green box that that's in the ground, right? Mm -hmm. And and then that box has what fiber running back yeah, to the central totally office. What uh, technology is being used? Do you know if you have DSL or not? Is is that what it's, it's based cable? On? But I couldn't tell you other than that. So it's coax cable. Yes. Okay. So yeah, how that works is you are on a shared media how that works. So basically your coax is going to a, uh, that junction box out there literally is just electrically connecting everything together and putting um, everybody back into a distribution cable that eventually, yes, will go to a box that has a fiber home run back to what they call the head end of the cable. Side. Mm -hmm. If it was DSL, it'd be very similar. You'd have copper wire going from your house that box outside again is just a copper distribution that'll go farther down the road, maybe, you know, half a mile. <clears throat> and then there's a box where all the copper plugs in called a D slam that then has fiber going back to it. So yes, in most cases, whatever distribution wiring they're using is going to go back to an aggregator of some kind 
and then you're going to be sent back fiber back to their core facility, the central office or head end, depending on what the terminology that, that people use. Now, there are also things where you can get uh, fiber to the home or fiber to the like curve. Verizon Fios. Yes. And in that case, the fiber, instead of aggregating, they're running fiber closer to you. So they're either running fiber to a node at the end of the street and you're getting coax back to you, which may be what you're doing. Um, or they're running a fiber terminal all the way to the side of your house. So you'll see an orange cable coming up into the, the box on the side of your house, and then you've got an actual fiber terminal connection. And that is also typically a shared media called PON. And so you're basically sharing the light with everybody else, but that media is so wide bandwidth, you don't you don't really have to worry about that you're sharing it. Whereas coax, you can get congestion. Um, you know, on that because there's just not as much overall bandwidth. DSL, you know, everybody says, well, you've got your own connection. It's better than cable. It's just where it aggregates, you know, is a little different, but you're still shared at some point. Uh, every service I've, at some point, you're being aggregated into a box with a big pipe, right. you know, so. And I, I got to say, whether I, I, no matter where I've lived in Northeast Ohio, um, my cable internet has always been superior to DSL. Yeah. Every single time. And I well, don't know, maybe it's, it's maybe that they've I'm invested worried. more money in their, their infrastructure. You know, the DSL is still using the copper cable plant that was put out for, you know, regular analog phone service. And in some mm -hmm. places they've invested heavily in fiber and, and you have fiber closer to you, but in others, you're on copper cable for a really long time. And you know there's right. There's a lot of problems with loss and when it gets wet, there's issues because that cable is so old that at some point they put mm -hmm. amplifiers and things like that on the line that screw up data services. So, you know, it really depends on where you are. Like I'm down in the south where Bell South was. Um, they spent a lot of money putting fiber out everywhere um, to get as close to customers as they can. So there's AT and T Uverse down here, which is kind of like Fios up, up north. Um, but, you know, that's not universal. And it just depends where you are, what the cable plant looks like. If if the cable company has spent more money bearing fiber, then they're going to look better than the phone company that still hasn't. You know, so it's, it. there's not a universal answer to that. If you can get into a lot of politics here because there was a lot of money that was supposed to be used to upgrade that infrastructure that did not get used to upgrade that infrastructure. So we don't have to go there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right. So uh, my house, their house, all the houses, they all go to the, I'm just going to keep calling it the big green box. Yep. And that big green box is that thing basically just a, a, a big, tall outdoor switch. Kind of. Yeah. It's, it's a media converter and, uh, you know, switch. It is usually Ethernet coming out of the back end of it these days. Um, well, and I just want to clarify, I'm I'm only saying switch for for the MSP to think about what a switch does at its yep. at its core. I'm not worried about the the connector type. I don't right. care if it's an RG fifty whatever or a. Right. I don't care that that part yeah, it, it, doesn't It's basically anymore. again, it's an aggregator. Um, which is what okay. a switch is as well. So it, it's there's different types of electronics depending on what type of connection is, but its sole job is to take a lot of smaller connections and aggregate them into one or two, you know, upstream connections depending on how it's built. Could be more, but um, and then there is a concept that is used very heavily in ISP and telecom world, which is oversubscription. Right. Yes. There is not. And that was going to be my next question your, as far as how yeah. that works. If you're, if you're in a neighborhood with 51 gig connections, there is not 50 gigs upstream from you. There is probably two gigs upstream from you. Best case. Right. So they, it depends on who it is. You know, five to one is the like, that's what you really should do. Anything more than five to one over subscription is bad in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. but they're usually doing 10 to 20, maybe 40 to 50 to one. Um, because that's money, right? I mean, they can't, sure. those electronics get more expensive, the bigger interfaces they put in, the type of fiber and repeaters they have to put in gets more expensive. So it's not just that they're malicious and don't want to put it in. It's that, you know, everybody wants it for cheap and they want it fast. And it's, it's really hard to, 
um, accommodate both those requests without cutting right. something somewhere. So, and that's also with like DSL and a lot of those things, how often they go back and look at that oversubscription and upgrade, you know, that's when you're dealing with a network. And again, I'm not making excuses for them, but I've been in the seat where you're dealing with a network with millions of subscribers on it. You've got a hundred people in your neighborhood. They're not showing up on any of the reports I'm looking at. You know, if I'm at that level looking where to invest money, because we're looking at how does Ohio look, not how does your city look, you know, and that's unfortunately what happens is you get lost in the aggregation of that. Um, and, And that's, I'm not, some people do a very good job of it and do look at everything regionally very closely. Um, so I've got a lot of friends that still do that. And I'm sure if they see this, they would uh, be unhappy with my statement that they don't look. But the point is you get lost in oversubscription and aggregation pretty easy as things scale up. I I actually, I don't feel like I'm getting lost in that. Like, you know, when I'm doing something on the internet, like I get my gig, man. Yeah. So well, that's probably either my neighbors don't do anything or well, they, they do a pretty a, good job. Yeah, you're at a smaller regional provider it sounds like so they can pay more attention because their purview is smaller they don't have to look at as much so they probably are doing a better job of maintaining the network and like you said it it could just be that the area you're in is not being as heavily utilized and you you're getting the benefit of that so so you said that there might only be hypothetically two gigs coming out of my big tall green box Mm -hmm. but like how like so so like you know when when they run wire from from the box in my yard mm-hmm. to wherever the next box is in that mm-hmm. aggregating thing right mm-hmm. when, when they run that wire like they're not running a wire that is only max capable of 2 gigs is it well if depends on which piece you're talking about. So the wire going from your house does have electrical limitations. You can, you can only, sure. you can only uh, pass traffic at there's theoretical limits, depending on the length of it and the gauge of the cable and all that kind of stuff. Right. Well, so, well clearly it can do yeah. a gig. So, yeah, so well, it's, it's limit. Yeah. And, that, and that's why um, you don't get bi-directional, you know, asynchronous where you're, you know, you're getting gig in both directions because the equipment in that green box can push more traffic down that copper wire than your equipment is capable of because those are higher end electronics with more power and everything involved. That's why DSL and a lot of these things are not um, symmetrical, right? The box sending to you can push a lot more across that wire than your little modem can push back it's it's there's electrical Mm -hmm. reasons why and again the cost of the electronics to do it are different um so they can't they can't symmetrically both have both directions going gig there's not enough bandwidth a to do that and b electronics wise there's actually different levels of electronics on both sides so um the the, there are all kinds of we could get into the theoretical limits of what they could do on copper and everything else and there's there's a lot of technologies that can do all kinds of amazing stuff. I mean, when I first started doing DSL, they were doing one meg on it. And that was like, they were blown away that they amazing. were able to walk one meg because yeah. previously it was 56 K modems was as fast as you were going to yeah, get. I mean, but, one meg is still almost 20 times faster. Like, yeah. So, um, you know, they keep pushing. The a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it was, it was night and day. Um, but then, you know, upstream from that, you know, you're calling it the green box upstream from the green box. They're using traditional, you know, ethernet technologies, right? So they can do 10 gig, 40 gig, hundred gig. They could aggregate many hundreds of gigs together. Um, so they're not limited there. The main thing they're limited by there is the availability of the fiber. And then that's going to get aggregated into some other box upstream upstream that probably is going to do 40 or 10 gig. Um, so you just keep getting aggregated and aggregated and aggregated until you get to the core of their network, which then probably is, you know, multiple hundreds of gigs or, you know, multiple 40 gigs, things like that, depending on the size of the network you're working with. So when, um, when I say 
my my internet's not fast at home, even though I'm paying for a gig. I'm only getting 300 meg. It could be the box. It could be something inside my house, but it could also be the wire going from my house to the green box or anywhere else from that green box along the way. Yeah, you could be constrained. Probably, point. probably closer to the home, though, right? The most likely place to get constrained is that upstream from the first box. That's the biggest choke point, right? So from your green box up is is very likely for you to get choked out there because, again, hmm. it's massively oversubscribed. The oversubscription gets less and less the farther into the network you go because these cables that are carrying the thing aren't having to traverse long distances. They're within the same building and things like that. So they can put in 100 gig there and it's not as big a deal. Running 100 gig miles you know, from a central office to your aggregation box is very expensive. So that's going to be typically the weakest link is that and then what's called the last mile, which is what's going to your house. So it's going to be one of those two, either the equipment or the cabling has issues or you're constrained because it's oversubscribed too much. Got it. So now let's talk about the fun part, the cool part. Okay. The the actual uh, head end or whatever you call the 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 big master hundreds of gigs room. Yep. Like like what's it like in that room? And how do you get, you know, tens if not hundreds of gigs from your room to the internet? So um in the most simplistic version, I guess, initially. So like I said, you've got all of these end users being aggregated up. That's what's known as the access side of the network, right? You've got all of these mm -hmm. people wanting access to the internet. So you're going to have these coming in from all those aggregation boxes. We'll say, you know, your, your particular provider, I think you said it was Armstrong. Just for simplicity's sake, we'll say they have 50 different aggregation points out there that are all coming back. So those are okay. typically going to come into an aggregation router of some kind that's going to have, you know, one gig, 2.5 gig, 10 gig ports or whatever on it. And that is typically now going to be a router, right? So it's going to be dealing with IP traffic. It's not dealing with Ethernet frames or anything. Everything up to here generally has not been looking at the IP part of it. It does not know that this is HTTP traffic or anything. It's just frames. It's just packets of information. So at this point, it's usually the ones first, and zeros. Best yeah, of this is usually the first place that it starts getting treated as IP traffic, right? So, um, and, and again, that could be at any number of places, but let's just, for simplicity's sake, say your green box goes directly all the way back to a central office or head end that has an aggregation box in it. There could be ones in between there in bigger networks. Right. Let's not go there. So let's say this this is the box that you're actually getting DHCP from, right? If your okay. box is set up for DHCP, this is the other end. This is your gateway, right? Your modem, mm -hmm. your your router there, you configured your IP address and you configured a gateway address. This is typically what that gateway address is. Again, there can be other variants, but let's simplify it down as far as possible. So now that box is going to have multiple, um, probably at a minimum 10 gig, if not 40 or 100 gig connections up to a core router, which this is going to be a box that has many, many, many slots, um, you know, fully redundant power. There's probably multiple of them. Then one connection goes to one router and one connection goes to the other. Um, and then this is where now all the customer's IP traffic is being aggregated um, from all those aggregation routers. They will then have upstream from them other sites that have these same core routers. So you can kind of envision now building a ring of all the sites they have. And there's these core routers here, and there's another set of core routers here, and there's another set of core routers here. And each of those then at each of the sites connect to border routers or, you know, your transit or internet routers, right? And at there, they're going to have 10 gig connections, 100 gig connections to other internet providers. Right. So there's a couple ways that can happen. If you're big enough, you do what's called peering, which means I'm just going to connect directly to Google because I have a ton of connections for Google and all my traffic to Google is going to go across this connection. If you're 
well, even if you are big, you then also have things called transit connections. So you say, I'm going to connect to Verizon. I'm going to connect to at and I'm going to connect to CenturyLink or Lumen or whatever they're called now. And we're going to advertise to each other what parts of the internet we know about using BGP. So BGP says, on my network, I know about all these IP addresses. So if you want to get to any of these IP addresses, you can come to me. The other one says the same thing. And so now my router gets all of those and figures out, okay, I know how to get to in aggregate all these IPs. And I know how to get to this one IP that you're trying to go to best by going across the Lumen connection because it has fewer hops, right? It looks better as far as it keeps track of how many routers it's gone through basically. So now that's what's happening. Your, your connection from your house, when you were looking at my webpage earlier, you know, you're, you're doing a DNS resolution, getting the IP address. That IP is not on your network. So it gets sent out your router up to that aggregation router. The aggregation router then goes to the core router. The core router looks and sees which border router has connections to where you're trying to go. And then that border router says, which of my upstream connections has the best connection to this IP address? And then it sends it out that way. And then that all keeps happening throughout all these networks, the same type hops of route lookup and pick the best connection route lookup you know until and it gets that makes sense because up. like once once it gets from you know like my isp to this next router each each router is a hop yes so that and what i described it is what could have trace route. two hops could be in the same building even oh absolutely yeah a lot of times it's bouncing around routers in the same building because again they're they're aggregating up because they don't want to buy internet connections for every single aggregation router or every single region. Right. They're, they're going to again oversubscribe or at least aggregate, if not oversubscribe um, into as few connections as they can, because those 10 gig connections or hundred gig connections to internet providers are extremely expensive. And so to, to get one of these connections, like I, I remember um, in Akron, there was, I don't know if there still is, there was a wind stream. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. That was a new Vox. Server room. I mean, that that's server room. Yep. You know, so, so uh, the assumption is the internet's in that room. Like, <laughs> yep. so like, you know, just like ISPs are running all of these lines in order to, to build out that access network. Yep. For my house and your house and whoever else's house to get online, mm -hmm. they have to, to run infrastructure that takes them from their router to AT&T's router to. Well, like yeah. So think of like I can and I don't know if this is still valid, but let's say in 2006 or so it was still valid when I ran it. Akron was subtended off of Columbus. So there was a windstream facility in Columbus. So instead of connecting to internet providers, Akron would have multiple connections going up to Columbus. And then Columbus, I'm trying to think of what all it was. Columbus probably went to Louisville, Kentucky, because Louisville was one of the bigger cities. And then Louisville would connect to Atlanta and Charlotte, for instance. And then Atlanta and Charlotte would have the big connections out to the internet. Um, so the, the number of levels of aggregation and hierarchy really kind of depends on, you know, what city you're in, what provider you're using. But you can be certain, like if you did a trace route and you were connected to that Akron site, you would see it go probably between a couple boxes inside the Akron office. And then it would go up to the Columbus office and maybe bounce around a couple routers. And then it would go to Louisville, Kentucky and bounce around a couple routers. Then it would go to you know Atlanta and bounce so how and then hit maybe, you know, Verizon or something. So how does it get from Akron? I got I I to make the point be in the camera, right? right? From Akron to Columbus, because that's a long distance. I mean, we're talking, you know, that's a two and a half hour drive. So yep. I suspect that's, you know, 150 miles, we'll call it, as the crow flies. Yep. So that's going to be fiber. So it's all speed of light at that point. Um, so, so that's, that's probably like, a five millisecond connection something like that two to five minutes. so so okay is there just one really long 200 mile fiber cable going from akron to columbus uh 
possibly, but most likely it's going to go through um, equipment that regenerates the signal, right? So, you yeah. know, light's going to degrade over the time period, bouncing around in that fiber cable. Eventually, it's not going to be bright enough anymore. So in the middle, there'll be something that receives that and then regenerates the same signal um, brighter again. That's one way to think of it. So it depends on the length and the technology being used. They've improved technology where you can go farther without regenerators because um, regenerators add latency because you know, it has to receive the signal, then regenerate it. Again, you're talking nanoseconds or milliseconds, but those all matter when you're doing this 20 times to get where you're going. Um, so I don't know for sure, you know, in that answer, but it, it could be. That's not out of the realm of a, of a cable that could be um, non-regenerated. So we're where the hell did they put that cable? <laughs> so there's aerial cable. So a lot of times it's running along the power, you know, with the power line. Um, okay. It also, they run along railroad tracks very often um, because it's oh. there and it's actually very easy for them to dig in. They have railroad cars, that, you know, kind of like when you see them trench your yard to put your cable back yeah. in, it digs a hole and puts it in and fills it right back in. They can dig huge troughs and pull it along the, Railroad, um, a lot of times it's along major roadways. They're going to try to find something that's already been cleared out. So power lines, um, railroad tracks, roadways. Um, that's why a lot of highways. Yeah, if there's a big wreck, they'll cut fiber because if somebody, you know, a big truck goes off the road and buries itself four feet into the ground, it very well could have buried itself and cut a cable in half. Railroad derailments are another big cause of fiber outages. And then mm -hmm. you, you might think this is funny, but that aerial fiber, there's something about some of the insulation they use that squirrels and birds and rodents love. So they'll chew it. There literally is a thing called a squirrel chew, which is an outage cause for uh, um, fiber. A lot going through the deep south is all aerial because it's swamp and they can't dig it. And there's all kinds of creatures down there that love to eat fiber. So they'll chew through it. So that is crazy. Yeah. It's, it's interesting the problems you run into that you would have never thought of. Yeah. So I, I appreciate this because <laughs> I, I like talking about it. the, the person that I, that I got my little tour of a data center, he was, he was the sales guy, you know, like sales guy doesn't know all of this stuff. Um, <laughs> I never would have thought, like, alongside a railroad, like, duh, that's genius. Yeah. No wonder they kick out all the homeless people. <laughs> so. Yeah, it's, it's, oh. uh, that right away is very valuable. So they use it a lot. Um, cause they've already got bridges built over waterways. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. that's prime real estate. So if you look at, I mean, it's not the only place, but the fiber distribution around the U.S., there's a lot of really important lines going along the, the railways. That's really cool. Now, uh, let's nerd out about railways for a little bit. Uh, don't worry. We're not going to talk about our favorite kind of train cars or anything. Um, so one of the organizations that I, uh, I'm involved with is an organization that, that helps the homeless. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, you know, like every month we go out and we, we give them a nice hot home, home cooked meal. You know, sure. Really good meal. I'm jealous. They're eating it. I'm not. I'm just going to go get Mexican when we're done. Uh, <laughs> Mexican's good. Don't get me wrong. Yep. Like I think a couple months ago, they had like, uh, like chicken and shrimp gumbo, and like mm. you know, month before that, I, th I think they had like, like grilled steaks. Like we we get such cool donations. That's awesome. Um, so. So yeah, like you know, we we'll do that kind of stuff. And um recently we were we were going to like this section of railroad in the hood of Akron. Yep. And basically essentially they the railroad company owns all that land. Yes. And we didn't know that. I mean, how would I know that? I, I don't live there. So um so the railroad company uh got like a backhoe or something. And they just went through there demolishing all the tents and everything. And yeah, the uh, 
this could go through a whole my, my father worked for the railroad so i know a lot of railroad history but when the railroads were built um the government gave the railroads insane amount of uh land and they have their own police force um, really yeah the, the railroad police are basically federal marshals so they have their own police force to basically they police that land um, huh. and they they have kind of free reign to do whatever they want there they're completely left alone the, because of the laws that were created to you know get the railroad built so yeah i could nerd out on that for a long time too but yeah it's it's uh it's its own crazy entity i mean they have their own retirement program instead of social security i mean there's all kinds of interesting stuff but yeah i uh i think it's it sucks that they would have they did that to them, but it's not surprising to me that they did it either, because they have a lot of the land where there's bridge underpasses and all kinds of stuff like that. That uh, you know, and you know, they'd say they're doing it for liability and everything because they don't want people getting killed on the the tracks and everything. Which some right. of that's true, I'm sure, but sure. Uh, yeah, that, that you do have to keep in mind that they they definitely own most of that land um, and enforce it very sovereignly. Huh. That is that is really interesting. Do you have do you have any other fun, <laughs> little known railroad information? You got any more dirt on the railroad I can have? Come on. No, they, they probably uh, have me killed if I told you anymore. That they do have their own communication likely. system. They were one of the first people to get access to the GPS system um, as really? a civilian organization that's outside the military. My dad showed me when I was very young one of their control centers and they could track where every train was down to like a meter. But at the time the GPS system for, uh, you know, civilians, you couldn't get more accuracy than like a hundred meters or something like that. You know, they intentionally made yeah. it not, not granular enough. But yeah, it's, it's actually, again, has nothing to do with this podcast, obviously, but it's a uh, very interesting society all in and of itself. Hmm. Very interesting. All right. Well, after after the ISP, mm-hmm. you went and th- were you one of the founders of Green Cloud? Yes. Yeah, that was in 2011. It was me again and uh, this time three other guys. And they were all from uh, Nuvox Windstream days. Um, so yeah, in 2000, June of 2011, we founded that and it's still going strong. Um, and I'm actually in talks with them to do another one because they just, they just like bought a, yeah. So now they're green cloud defense. They bought uh Cascadia defense or Cascada defense. I think so. So, and, and I'll, I'll have a bunch of questions for them. So I don't want to yeah. take up your time. I mean, sure. But, but yeah, that, but that was you... that was my life from uh, 2011 uh, until two years ago. I was building that up and going through all the trials and tribulations of basically the same stuff we talked about, making people understand the cloud and why you'd want to use it and what problems does it solve. And um, definitely with MSPs, making people understand that it's it's not necessarily better to build your own because like what we just talked about, data centers are the same thing as – you know, what we're describing, you have to have all that aggregation and network build out and redundancy. And, you know, it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, yeah, you can definitely put a rack in your office and run people's virtual machines, but uh, a lot more to it to, to do it right. Um, and a lot of lesson learned over the years of, you know, how to scale that. And it's a really large organization now. Um, you know, we started with four guys. Uh, we were actually in a, uh, old warehouse building uh, above a jazz club <laughs> when we started. I used to be on calls with uh, Cisco and they would tell me to turn my radio down and I couldn't because it was the jazz band playing underneath us the whole time. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, that's, it's, uh, that's the stuff I like though. I like building it from scratch, you know, and having those type stories yeah. um, of, you know, same thing with like Clemson when I was there, it was a 56 K connection. And now they have hundreds and hundreds of gigs, internet connectivity there. And, you know, it was really cool to be, you know, one of the people learning a lot of that stuff each step of the way of all these businesses. And 
you know, it's kind of what I'm trying to do now is again, figure out how to, I've got some stuff I'm working on um, product wise and stuff that I think will be pretty interesting. I may, may have a vendor session available for you for too much longer with some uh, products I'm talking about putting together for security to take a lot of these ideas and uh, productize them. So that's kind of what I'm, I'm working through right now. I would be interested in having that conversation. So one of the, um, one of the things that I'd really like to start doing is educating MSPs on things that they're definitely not doing, but should be. Yep. Um, especially when it comes to like basics of cybersecurity and, and that type of stuff. Yep. Um, I, as of right now, my opinion is is pretty strong that I I worry that MSPs should not be doing security. Not not in a like well nobody should, but in a we should just outsource that to somebody who knows what they're doing kind of thing. Um, because I I feel like many, probably most, MSPs have fallen way behind. When it comes to um, everything, when it you know, with with all the security that's out there, and and I think a lot of it is is because we're being sold to, and we're not being educated. Right. Well, yeah, I think there's a lot of mystery and intentional um, obscuring of how things work in the security space. Because I would argue, I think MSPs have a really large role to play but it may not be the role that they think, right? I think um, no security program is going to be successful if you don't get the participation of your client and all their employees. I and agree with that. a vendor that you outsource to is not going to be able to get that um, participation. And you're not going to be able to get that participation if you're not uh, well enough educated on it. And as you get educated on it, you'll realize there's a lot of basic blocking and tackling you can do that massively reduces the risk. Um, you know, having an intrusion detection system and having somebody run everything through Splunk or some SIM is great, but reducing the number of things that are going to that SIM, you know, by having humans participate better, because I think the number one thing that all MSPs need to understand is that, the individual humans are the weakest link in security. There is no box you can buy. There is no service you can buy that is going to stop people from getting social engineered unless you educate them, right? It's, it's not a technology. It's not just a technology problem because people in the, you know, in the hacker space, people have learned it's way easier to hack a person than it is to hack a platform. Right. I mean, everybody has firewalls now that have basic NAT rules on them. Nothing's open 100 percent to the Internet anymore. Nothing being a strong word, but, you know, it's a pretty good chance that someone's got a firewall that's for the most part protecting them. Yeah, they may have VPN rules misconfigured where people can get in that shouldn't or maybe they left an RTP, I mean, RDP uh, port open or something. But what's more often happening than not is the attacks are happening from the inside out. Right. Somebody's getting fished or somebody's getting vished. Somebody's getting manipulated, bottom line, whether they're being called or emailed or, um, you know, faked into believing they're winning something or, you know, whatever the case may be. And then they're using that person's access against them. So, you know, managing the people and uh, focusing on that is one of the core pieces of security, I think, is what a lot of people miss. They're not. They're thinking that it's some really complicated technology problem to solve, um, which you can get very complicated. And there definitely are some pieces of it you should outsource to somebody. But I think MSPs are the place where a lot of the stuff has to get applied. Um, at least the relationship and human to human stuff. There's no other place to apply it. You know, you can't fully outsource that. So um, I would love to have a conversation around that because I feel very, very strongly about that, that I think the people element is a huge part of security that, that uh, gets overlooked in uh, preference to technology being the way you solve it. 
like EDR tools are great. Um, but if you don't really understand what people's steady state is and what they're doing, understanding when something wrong is happening is um, very hard, especially if you go all the way up to an outsourced person. So a lot of the things I was talking about, like understanding the roles and what people do in a business and what they're actually using. Um, that's some of the stuff I'm building right now to where you can get a good understanding of what's normal for a customer. And then, um, you know, not having to use all these lists and use all these other platforms. If you know that a dentist only goes from the operating rooms to four sites on the internet, why do they need access to any other sites on the internet? Right. And that's hard to maintain if you're using that with block list and everything. But if you have some technology that says, no one at this company has ever gone to this URL. That's probably bad. You know, just some things like that, that, you know, you can put some of those things in place that you just limit the exposure they have. You know, they don't, they don't need to expose themselves to domains that were registered in the last 30 days, for instance. Almost every phishing domain that you hit was registered in the last 30 days. So if you just block all of those so they can't go to them, yeah they'll miss out on maybe some new business that started for a few weeks potentially, but likelihood of someone yeah, registering are they actually domain, trying to get to that new business. Yeah. Like what, but the, the chances of somebody registering a new domain and having an active service on it within 30 days is very, very unlikely. The chances mm -hmm. of somebody registering a domain to use an phishing attack the next day is extremely likely. You know, so there's a lot of things like that that I think are interesting and this goes to, you know, working with uh, colleges and, and, you know, how they're educating people now. Um, you know, there aren't just, everybody always talks about best practices. If the human element and thinking about the psychology of things is becoming very important in security. And I think the MSPs have the best opportunity to do something because you're the one that has the relationship. You're the one they listen to. You're mm -hmm. the one that knows these people and could even do any of this analysis. So, I don't know. It's it's interesting. I'm sure uh, Keith uh, at Green Cloud Defense is probably saying, no, it's technology and you need to outsource it all to me. And uh, there's a certain <laughs> degree to that that's right. Um, but I also think you would agree that the MSP has a huge role to play in it. Um, and I agree with you. You're absolutely right. I don't think MSPs know what that role is. And I think fear has crept in from lack of education and understanding um, and I think it would be, you know, this is one of those things that competitive or not, we all need to do better there because when, when one person fails, everybody in the industry looks bad. You know, when that person fails, we all go down with them. So you know, I think everybody getting better well, space is important. And, and, you know, the, the scary thing about that statement is, you know, when one person fails, the whole industry looks bad right now people continue to fail. Mm -hmm. And, and I mean, like, I, I think we can all agree that like exploits are going to happen. Hacks are going to happen, but like, you know, the, the things like, you know, the, the Microsoft exchange server thing, mm -hmm. I think um, F5 currently has a thing. Solar winds mm -hmm. had a thing. Um, I think connect wise might've had a thing like, mm -hmm. You know the the list keeps going, and it's and it's not even all just IT companies. I mean, NI was it NIH that had a thing? National sure. Institute of <laughs> Health. It, it was it was the it was the big health one over in Europe somewhere. Yeah, but like yeah. you know, the, I think it was the like, UK. It's not just, yeah, I mean it's and it's not just IT companies. You know, it's like everyone's getting hit, and I think that right now we are all failing as as it people as technology people we're all failing and we we all need to get our shit together is is the the honest truth and and i don't know how we just magically do that because i see cybersecurity as this like uh, to to go back to what we were talking about before i'll use a fun analogy cybersecurity is this train that's gone down the track at full speed, okay? And we all hopped off that train. 
when we got to a certain point, you know, we all deployed our EDR and our DNS filtering and our, our spam filtering and whatever else. And we hopped off and, and we stopped, we stopped educating ourselves because we thought we had all these products that were keeping our clients safe. Yep. And how on earth are we going to catch back up to that train? Yeah. And you know, the scary part is hackers know that they know that you're counting on firewalls they know that you're counting on, you know, EDR tools. They know you have an RMM tool installed, um, and they know you trust that stuff. So they're using a lot of that stuff against everybody at this point um, because it's easier, like I said, to, you know, hack somebody at an MSP and get a password, and you got the keys to the city then. Um, and it's not an – It's. Re- I really don't feel like – hopeless about it. It's a big education thing is what it is more than anything. You know, fear starts coming from lack of understanding, right? And so it's this big, crazy thing that you don't know and how are you going to learn? It's just like you said, that train's now a dot off on the horizon and you're like, well, shit, how do I ever learn anything about that? I don't even know what that is anymore. So um, I think that uh, it's really just everybody talking about it. And I think You got to talk about it to your customers and not steer away from it Um, because I think that's what happens a lot of times too is people try to get their customers to do stuff. It's hard. They promise Mm -hmm. they're going to circle back to it. They never do, Um, you know, trust backups and stuff like that, which you can't trust backups anymore because hackers are smart enough to know they need to install their stuff and then wait a long time before they use it. So it's even in your backups, you know, so you can't, you can't just depend on a lot of the stuff that used to work. Um, you got to be very diligent and active just as much as you're monitoring backups and networks and, you know, whether an internet connections are up, you got to have an active thought process around security too. And a lot of it is, like I said, educating the end customer to, you get more, you get more of a workforce if you get them involved in it. Right. I mean, I have one customer who calls me all the time excited that she caught a phishing email. She's like, I didn't click on it. I would have clicked on it before, but this is right. I, this is this is a scam, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's absolutely a scam. You're, you're getting really good at this. And uh, I had uh, post-it notes made that say this is not where passwords go. And when I'm at customers, I stick them all over their monitors. And they say that's that, hilarious. And then I come back and uh, they've taken them all down. They're like, look, we put them into keeper they're in our password manager now you know message received so it's just a lot of stuff like that it's just you know i mean that doesn't solve all the world's problems but if those are three people within that organization that don't have their passwords sitting out on the screen and won't just click on a phishing email you've made a lot of progress right and you didn't have to learn new software i'm telling you that the people element is is the, the key to getting a lot more comfortable with all this stuff. It's not the only piece. You do have to be technically savvy and have enough uh, continuing education type stuff yourself. But I think, you know, and that only helps you. The more you communicate and talk to your customers and show them value, the better for you anyway. You know, QBRs and all that stuff are great. But if they tell people, well, hey, he just calls me every now and then and checks in, sees if I'm using my password manager or whatever, that kind of stuff goes a lot farther than, um, you know, a report or, you know, a QBR type thing, just being Mm -hmm. proactive and showing people and you don't have to do anything crazy. Just show them you're thinking about them and show them that you've got to, you know, that they're making progress and you're proud of them. I mean, it it sounds silly, but it makes a huge difference. Makes them want, makes them want to do more. Some, sometimes, you know, you, 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 what is it? You get more flies with honey or something like that. Like, um, sometimes you just gotta, it's like your kids, man. Would, you know, when you were a kid, would you have rather, you know, your parents crap all over you all day long or tell you how proud of you they are? Right. Like, you know, clients are the same thing. Yeah. Especially when it comes to technology. Like they, they all say like, Oh, I'm technology illiterate, which I mean, they're so illiterate, they don't even know what the word illiterate means. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, so you can't read technology. I get it. Like, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. One thing that's really worked well for us is uh, I kind of took it from the pharmaceutical sales side of things, especially when you go into healthcare because they're used to it, is do bring in lunch or bring in breakfast, um, you know, once a month. Just pick, mm-hmm. you know, you don't have to do it to all your customers every month, but pick a customer and bring breakfast or lunch and just sit down in the break room and be there and, you know, just ask people as they come in, how's it going? You know, what, what's, what's been working well, what's not that stuff makes a huge difference. And you can interject education in there, you know, as you're doing it and you can do it fun ways. Like I said, like those post-it notes or, you know, um, joking around with them about something you saw on one of your reports or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, the fishing test stuff where you catch people, you know, that's, that's one of the funnest times to mess with anybody. And it, you know, you don't want to be, I'm the nerd and I'm smarter than you. It's more fun to have the page that comes up when they get caught, be a joke and be something funny. And, you know, that you can reference back when you're out there and stuff. Um, I do see a question that says people are, He's concerned about this, the, you know, this ability to resource um, yourself enough to manage security, um, you know, with you got the smaller clients. And I mean, it's a completely valid concern. There's no doubt about it. It's mm-hmm. all these things I'm talking about are more time, not less time. Um, but, you know, I, I, I see it as the same thing as like patching and um, monitoring your customers. If you're not proactive right. on some of these things, this is just another thing that has to be added into the proactive list. Um, and I think the the challenge is, is getting to where you don't consider it something so different than what you're doing today. I mean, there's just practices, you know, compliance and security sounds like this other thing, but you have compliance and processes and, and that kind of stuff around the other part of what you do for customers. These are just more processes that need to be incorporated into that. And, you know, it's just like anything, just because you can't do it all doesn't mean you shouldn't do something, right? Even if you Mm -hmm. just do a few of these things, you're reducing your risk substantially. Um, And again, even if it's something like the Cyshurance stuff, that doesn't necessarily stop a breach from happening, but it keeps your customer in business if the breach does happen, right? So there's some things like that you can do. And, uh, you know, I don't have a problem with, with, you know, the Arctic wolves and green cloud defense or, you know, whoever you want to list, um, there, there's a place for them. You know, they are, they are, they are, uh, building a workforce that is much more educated and capable than you're going to be able to build. And I think Anthony called on the same thing is that, yeah, it's it's easy. He's got a good point. Yeah, it absolutely is. He's he's got a good point. Yeah, and, and so he says, patching and monitoring are more easily quantified and automated than securing apps, web servers, networks, endpoints, internal servers, software as a service, shadow IT. Um, yep. And he's right. I mean, when when you look at it, like, wh- what is easier for me to do? Patch a thousand endpoints or look through the logs of a thousand endpoints. (laughs) Um, And I think that's, that's where MSPs need to get smart and, and learn how to work with um, some of these vendors, like, you know, the Vigilands and the other socks as a service that are out there. I mean, I think, I think you can also then, you know, kind of use that same analogy. Patching thousands of servers used to really suck too. Right. You know, that, that is something that improved massively over time as tools got better and people, you know, shared a lot of those methodologies with each other. It, it's Anthony, I think my first answer would be, you're absolutely right. Like none of this is, is easy, um, but I think we have to start taking some steps. Um, and some of those things are, you know, I don't believe that it's going to be feasible for you to look through all the log files, but I do think it'd be feasible to implement some practices that will, reduce scenarios that'll even end up in the log files and things like that. I, th- I think as a, as an industry, we could come up with some best practices that would, you know, things like lateral movement on a network. Why mm-hmm. do we allow desktops to talk to other desktops? There's, there's no reason that in most organizations, no desktop should talk to another desktop. 
what is a valid scenario for that? And if you leave it that just way, in now, case. yeah, well, that's the problem is you leave it that way. Now someone infects one box and they can do lateral movement across your whole network. And so, yeah, you mm -hmm. can either watch for lateral movement or you can say, I know my customer well enough to know there is zero reason that Tom's machine should talk to Jan's machine. So let's firewall that off completely. And you can, you know, yeah, you can do that at the software layer and that can be exploited still, or there is technology now, even the Unify stuff allows you to do uh, blocking between ports on the switches and things like that. Um, like I said, there's some, there's some new ways to do DNS filtering and stuff, I think, where you're not depending on a list being accurate, that you can stop some behaviors that shouldn't exist. You know, I think there, there's, there's things we can do. It's not foolproof. It doesn't stop every scenario, but it's a huge leap beyond what's currently happening. And it helps. A hacker always takes the path of least resistance, right? And if mm -hmm. a lot of the things are the path of least resistance, and if you can shut down those and other people have not, they're going to go to the place where it's still easier to hack somebody and, you know, not not waste their time on something that's harder when they can go to a thousand other sites um, and you know, kind of nail it. So, and, and Anthony's right. You know, w we probably should not be doing flat fee services for some of this, you know, uh, for a lot of these security things, you know, maybe, maybe we should go back to retainer based or uh, time and materials based or, or something along those lines, or maybe, we need to stop saying, oh, it's $250 a user and start saying, oh, it's, you know, $10 a user for port blocking or, you know, find ways to, to break this stuff up so that way the clients understand I'm, I'm only paying for this stuff. And if I expect more security, here's this menu of more security. And maybe he's got bundles of, of all the things. Um, yeah, the, the but, challenge but always becomes overwhelming people I, with too many options. You know, you can you can go backwards you're, sometimes too. You're right, but I I think as as big as security is, like for any of you that have Sirius XM, you know, there's a boatload of channels you could print out a full eight and a half by eleven sheet and still not be able to necessarily read them all because the font's too tiny. My point is we could easily have that size sheet with that many options for security because of all the nuances and and just the different stuff that our clients are using. And is that the right way to do it? Probably not. But it would at least be a, a good demonstration of, hey, so... Here's why it's eight hundred dollars a user because we're doing all this stuff. <laughs> I think you'll make everybody on here happy if you can figure out eight hundred dollars a user. That's for sure. I think. Well, the, I mean, if you look at look, I, look at some of these attorneys, though, Eric. I mean, if if you look at an attorney that specializes in MSP contract law, eight hundred an hour. If you go to your local attorney who you know does some contracts here and there, two fifty an hour. Yeah. Like the the rates are are ridiculous when you when you start to look at somebody that specializes in, in it's, it's something. It's our it's our bane of our existence as IT people is that we've never, as a group, done a good enough job of holding value to where they understand. You know, lawyers don't bend on those prices. It just is what it is, and it's it's something you have to have. People understand mm -hmm. the ramifications of not having a lawyer uh, review their contract, right? Um, people don't seem to understand the ramifications of not securing their network, right? It's, it's not been, they all know somebody who's gotten screwed by a bad contract. They don't, no matter how often it happens, they just don't seem to know anybody who's gotten screwed bad enough that they feel like they need to pay a massive of these services. And that I think is the number one challenge on, on some of this stuff. You know, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's, I think it's a combination of both. You know, I think Anthony's, you know, on something there too, where you, you can, you can have outcome based one time scenarios um, that then justify the maintenance of that one time event, you know, afterwards. But again, 
Yeah, maybe it should be pro project thing. plus maintenance. Well, I don't know. I feel I like it's going backwards somewhat um, because then you're now having to negotiate every time, you know, you do something. You want them to see you as a, as a uh, kind of a general ledger code to where, you know. 800 bucks an hour. I'm happy to do that for them. <laughs> you know, no easy answer. This is this is always one of our, you know, plights in this industry is how do you get people? Oh right, like I'm work? I'm not arguing with you, person. I'm just trying to be a devil's advocate. No matter what option you took, I would take the opposite one. Okay, right. so <laughs> I think the the thing for me is I think it's easy to get get in a scenario where you do nothing because you can't figure out the perfect thing to do, right? You kind of get an mm -hmm. analysis paralysis around security. I think there's some basic things that you can do that put the customer in a lot better position. Um, and again, that could be a, probably a whole podcast in itself, but there's some of those basic things you could do that don't take a huge amount of maintenance ongoing and put you in a lot better position. I think things, like I said, like insurance, that puts you in a much better position and it's easier to justify and sell to them. Um, you know, some of the DR type options also help, you know, if you can't stop it from happening, at least have a good plan for what you do when it does happen. Um, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that's step one and then try to prevent as many scenarios as you can qualify and quantify and at least do those. And, you know, you, you, you be honest with the customer that security, as you can tell, is a very evolving thing. We're going to try to mm -hmm. you know, build the best wall we can, um, but there's still people that have better ladders and get over. You know, so that's why we have these things that when they get over, you've got insurance, you've got backups, you've got cloud recovery, you've got, you know, whatever makes sense for the scenario you're talking about. I think that's that's the base level of stuff that needs to be happening across the industry so that we're not just all again, as strong as the weakest link, right? If, if too many more cities, um, especially if any more MSPs get hacked and many customers get hacked as a result of it, our reputation is garbage at that point. You know, nobody's going to listen to us as authorities on any of this stuff anymore. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, we're, we're headed down a path where we're eventually going to get regulated. Yeah. It's already starting to happen. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very challenging conversation. Um, but is. like I said, I think you just gotta, it's just like everything. Like I said, I mean, maybe patching wasn't the best example, but the number of challenges like right. this that have popped up over the years that seem insurmountable at first, you just have to start, you know, slowly chipping away at it. And the fact that you did four things is better than you doing zero things the day before it may, you may have exactly. missed the most important one, which is the fifth thing, but you know, you'll get there next. And I know that we could easily continue talking about this for, you know, hours to come and, and still probably get nowhere. Right. Um, but we are, we are approaching the two hour mark. Holy cow. Um, Anthony, I I love all of your all of your comments. Um, I I agree with you. We are at a, a time where we really need to be having these types of conversations, um, not just with our clients but also with each other. I think now is the time for us to be working together, and and for us to stop looking at each other as competition. And for us to start looking at each other as partners, because right now, think of us like we're all brain surgeons and the brain is bleeding and I can't fix it and Eric can't fix it. But maybe if the two of us work together, we can maybe come up with a different plan than what each of us individually could have. Think well, and about what's, what's if, even worse is there might be a third person who knows exactly what to do, but we're not talking right. to each other, so we don't find out. I mean, that's that happens so much in technology. It's extremely frustrating. That's why I love all the peer groups and things where people finally do mm -hmm. let their guard down and, and talk about stuff because, yeah, like you said, we're competitive, but 
if enough of this stuff happens and if we get regulated too heavily, you know, that's, that's going to be lights out for a lot of people. And, you know, it would be silly to have avoided just talking to each other um, and sharing a lot of this stuff because we all know there's more than enough for all of us out there. <laughs> you Absolutely. Know, more often Absolutely. than not, we all lose to inaction versus losing to each other. So I think it's, uh, you know, I think it makes sense for us to try to talk more. And I'm happy to talk anytime you want on this stuff. As you can see, I love talking. But. Me too, man. Well, well, thanks for coming on here, Eric. I, I really appreciate yeah, thanks you, for having you taking time out of your day. This was awesome. Um, Anthony, thanks for hopping in here at the end. Um, I hope to see you at one of the, the future episodes. Uh, speaking of future episodes, tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern, I will be speaking with Paul Green about marketing your MSP. So I hope to see you all then. And until then, you all take care. Have you been looking for a way to stay focused on your goals and grow your MSP? Accountability groups from Rocket MSP can help. We offer weekly accountability sessions that meet online with a group of your peers. Your success begins with accountability. Go to www.rocketmsp.io to join your accountability group today.